So much passed every night in the silence, settling over those houses that all looked much the same, on a hillside creeping up against the rock and gorse, and tipping down to the river where it widened, widened, and ended in the sea. We went from village to village, said Mr. Mercer in the dark. We had a map to start with, but it soon gave out. We asked the way. Sometimes we had a guide from place to place. We had one when it happened, funnily enough. To be honest, said Mr. Mercer, I was a wee bit jealous of him. You mean she flirted? Mrs. Mercer asked. I mean they had the language and I was only learning still and couldn't always follow. They laughed a lot. They made some jokes I couldn't understand. Also they went ahead a bit more than they needed to, perhaps. Or perhaps I let them. Perhaps I lagged behind on purpose and let them go ahead. I don't know why. We were on a path around a slithery purple rock and the glacier on the right of us below. They were laughing. I must have let them go ahead. Then the path went round the rock face left and they were out of sight. Last sound but one I heard from her was laughter when she was already gone out of sight. And the very last, her scream. When I got there she'd gone and the guide was looking down. His face was dirty yellow, I remember. Was she a blonde? Mrs. Mercer asked. No, said Mr. Mercer. Her hair was black. I thought she'd be blonde, said Mrs. Mercer, being German. No, said Mr. Mercer. I told you when I told you the whole story. Her hair was like yours, black. Like mine, said Mrs. Mercer. Wednesday was library day. Same again, said Mr. Mercer. His hands were trembling. He had a scared look. Same sort of thing, said Mrs. Mercer. Mind how you go. Whatever is in there, behind the eyes, or around the heart, or wherever else it is, whatever it is that is not the husk of us, will cease when the husk does, but in the meantime never ages, does it? Explain him otherwise his agitation when he thinks of Katya in the ice, her bodily warmth and merriment, night after night, as Mrs. Mercer, in the wooden houses among flowers in the snow, comes up in him, an old man near the end, inhabits him as thoroughly as does his renewing blood. Sweet first girl, sweet, unimaginable shock of the simple sight of her the first time without her clothes. What am I going to do about it? he asks himself aloud. Nothing. What can I do? At dinner time, he said, this global warming. What about it? Mrs. Mercer said. I read some more about it in the library in a magazine. I've read that book you brought me, by the way, Mrs. Mercer said. Sorry, he said. They're very worried in Switzerland, especially. Where's all the water going? The glaciers are melting, but the water's not come down yet. They think it's waiting, like a dam. I see, said Mrs. Mercer. They fear it will all come down at once one day. Very likely, said Mrs. Mercer. Then she said, When you tell me she's still there where she fell, does that mean people can see her if they go and look? Yes, said Mr. Mercer. That's what the letter said. Still there, apparently. Just the way she was. Twenty in the dress of that day and age. She'll come down when the waters break with mud and rocks and anything human in the way of it will be wiped out. But we shall be dead by then and turning in our own clay in the earth. In the night, in the utter silence of the nights among those little houses where old people live, she felt him leave the bed and in the pitch black reach his dressing gown and leave the room. She let him go. How it troubled her, all this. Not much to ask, peace of mind at night, and a bit of ordinary cheerfulness in the day, some conversation, something to laugh about, and doing nobody any harm, and not all this. A slit of light came on under the bedroom door. She heard him fishing about above his head with the stick, tap, tap, for the hook to fetch the trap door down and the ladder on it to mount into the loft. He'll break his neck. But she heard the steps creak and the gasps of his exertion as he got up there. He'll freeze to death. 
how cold it was in the space under the roof under their little living space, bitter cold and draughty, where they stored the past, its bulk and minutiae, in boxes, parcels, bags or sagging shelves, in hidey holes diminishing with the rafters. She heard him on the ceiling above the bed, rooting around, the slithering of cartons, heard the efforts, then silence. She slept, woke in a sudden terror over his absence still, stood in her nighty at the foot of the ladder, cold even there, calling up to him, till finally he showed himself, wrapped up and shivering without his teeth, leaning over the hole, his face a blue-grey with the cold and grief. He leaned down over the hole, above her upturned face, its halo of thin silver hair, and tried to say nothing to worry about, but couldn't, and made a gibbering noise, the photos clutched two-handed against his heart. He slept late, and shuffled in without a shave. His hand was shaking. She poured his tea. That's enough now, she said. Yes, he said. But asked could she remember where she had put the big atlas. I just want to look, he said. Under the sofa, since it was more wide than fat. And my boots, he said. I beg your pardon? My boots. But those aren't the ones. No, no, but I always bought the same. She thought they might be in the shed under the old fish tank. That stick I brought back might be in there as well, he said. I dare say, said Mrs Mercer. And will you make an appointment and get something to quieten you down? He had found the photos in a book of hers he was carrying for her in his rucksack when she went ahead with the guide and out of sight fell down through the snow into a crack in the glacier. It was a book of poems in Gothic script with a Nazi eagle stamped on the inside cover. In the pages were some gentians, flat and nearly black, but blue if you looked long enough, an eternal blue. In the photograph she was just as she was, slim, in a long skirt, smiling, her black hair in a curve around her cheek. The white mountains were behind. The path she stood on to be photographed often looked vertiginous, but were safe enough in reality, until the last one. They were heading south, more or less, trying to find a way into Italy, as she said she had always wanted to. Her idea was there would be a last big climb up very high, where it would be hard to get your breath, and after that all the streams would run the other way, and they would run down with them, getting warmer and warmer, through an unbelievable profusion of flowers, and before long they would see the vines, and that would be Italy. But some days they forgot where they were going, and if a place was nice, they stayed.